kol omer kra v'amar ma'ekra, kol abasar chatzir, v'chol chasto k'tzitz hasade, yavesh chatzir novel tzitz ki ruach Adonai nashvabo. Achein chatzir ha'am, yavesh chatzir novel tzitz udavar Elohenu yakum li'olam. A voice says to cry out, but I ask, what shall I cry? All flesh is like grass, and all of its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers and the flower fades when a wind from God blows upon it. Surely, therefore, people are like grass. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. Mizmor le David, Adonai roi lo echzar bino deshi arbitzeni, almei menuchot yin haleni, nafshi yishovev, yancheni v'magle tzedek laman shemo. Gam ki eilech begeit salmavet, lo ira ra ki ata imadi. Shiftecha umishantecha hema yinachamuni. Ta'aroch lefanai sholcha neged sorai. Dishanta v'ashem en roshi kosi revaya. Achto v'chesed yir defuni. Kol yemei chayai v'shafti b'veid Adonai li'orech yamim. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He has me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He guides me on paths of righteousness. He revives my soul for the sake of his glory. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no harm, for you are with me. Your staff and your rod, they comfort me. You set a table inside of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall abide in the house of the Lord forever. Jeffrey? My mother, Mevin Faust, had many amazing gifts. And as this recently, I had a few brief conversations with Amy about uh, being interested in family history. <clears throat> and it, it was really struck me then yesterday about how these many gifts of my mother, how so many of them really converge with gifts that are in our family. And both from you know, the biological children of, uh, of Joseph and Esther Brown, as, as well as our spouses and our children and grandchildren. So today the focus is going to be on my mother, but I encourage everyone to kind of reflect as I share some things about her, to kind of reflect back on, on the gifts that are in us that uh, maybe she touched us in a good way about, and also to encourage us and feel strengthened in those gifts within ourselves to, with God's help to flourish and carry on the, our legacy. The first of the spirits of, of the characteristics are very much the sense of spirit and enthusiasm. It actually goes back to the day of her birth and also very much from all the family, but especially my grand, late grandfather, whom we call Papa, uh, Joseph Brown, um, on her day of birth. And it was amazing talking with you, Josh, that our mothers had the same exact birthday, July 17th, 1922, truly a day of much, much blessing. And so at, my mother was born in New York City. The family had an they owned an apartment house on the east side, in East 94th Street. And my grandmother was in the hospital on the west side, the other side of Central Park. And at the time, unlike you know, now, where you can be with, you know, the husband and wife can be together at a birth, they didn't allow that. It was like 1920s, very quote unquote modern, 1920s. So Papa had to wait at 94th Street on the east side till he got the word that my mother was born. And as soon as he did, you know, he was just waiting on, uh, you know, on needles and he raced across Central Park. 
you know, as soon as he uh, heard the new news. So that kind of enthusiasm that, that just filled with, with spirit and, and potential and, you know, really wanting to get to something. So that started right at the beginning. And being in New York City, in our, our family goes back a number of generations and had a lot of very interesting characters. And uh, my uh, mom took full advantage coming from the beginning of the Roaring Twenties of the last century. We're almost, it's unbelievable, we're almost to the new century now. So uh, one of her great uncles, um, Harry Lipkowitz, um, was the manager of Fox of Follies. So as a, a little girl, she would take the subway downtown to Fox's Follies and just kind of hang out there. And uh, it kind of also you know, sparked, she always had an interest in, in drama. And even though she was sometimes very formal, she also got to be a real cut up. And uh, you know, that was a little bit of her spirit too. Um, later on, uh, when she uh, went into teaching, she, uh, even, she always made things happen. So even in elementary school, she became like the head of the drama. And this was in Akron. And uh, you know, they didn't have anything for Hanukkah. They had a Christmas thing. So she added in um, you know, a Hanukkah celebration. Um, she brought it in when um, she brought foreign languages into the elementary schools, full immersion. And as part of that, and I was like in fifth grade at the time, she had me with the, with the French teacher and herself. We acted out plays like Les Trois Ours, like Three Bears um, and Goldilocks. We did it all in French, you know, to get people into the mood about the holiday. So she would find different ways to uh, do that uh, through her life. So she had that whole side, you know, as, as well as a more formal side. Um, <clears throat> one other very important thing from, from her uh, youth, um, in 1927, the year that Lillian was born, um, the family moved out to what was called the Sticks, which meant Sunnyside, like the near, where the World's Fair was, you know, the near side of Queens. And uh, then uh, my mom was sent in, in a taxi cab to a special progressive uh, kindergarten. And that kind of set the stage for her overview of education um, because she was very much in creating learning environments and, and engaging people and bringing them into finding their own way to learning. Educater and education. And that's certainly one of the things in our family. We have all kinds of teachers. My father was a teacher. You guys do, you know, some teaching, and uh, so that was, you know, very much, very much kind of made her life. Another major um, characteristic is seeing and empowering and making things happen. So when I was um, like four years old, I remember we just moved, and uh, I was sitting on the front lawn, and my mother was a take taking a picture with those old-fashioned cameras with, with kind of two lenses, and I noticed that I could see my reflection. And she said, you know what, here's something even more interesting, that uh, you can look in, in the eyes, and you can see a reflection in a person's eyes. And her, her careful, like, looking and seeing, she could, when she went from being an elementary school teacher, first grade, later on to become a university professor, and um, some of the same students she had, like in first grade, even though maybe they would have beards and be all kinds of looking different, by knowing the look of the eye and the inset of a person, she could always recognize somebody, even like years later, and they really changed. So that certainly sparked me. And another aspect of seeing and paying attention um, was brought back to me when we were traveling here from Boston. We had to stop in Philadelphia. And uh, I was just sitting and watching people and getting a sense of who they were and what they were about and remembering that my mother first really taught you know, me about that kind of observing and, and paying close attention. Um, for instance, when I was going to college, she said, and, and I give this advice to folks too, that if you want to know what a place is like, you also have to just go in a place and sit and watch, you know, like go into a dining hall or you know, go and just watch and pay attention. So that was very much her thing, and that's certainly one of the, about seeing one of the strong characteristics of my wife, and actually um, you too, Erica, of brilliant photographers seeing things that nobody else sees. So that was, I first got that legacy from my mom. The other important thing about 
seeing is that she could see people's underlying potential and always have expectations that they could rise to the occasion, which is like really important, I think, for all of us. And uh, when she first started teaching, she would, they would always give her like the worst kids, the ones that thought were troublemakers, and she would like turn it around and they'd be the highest achievement, you know, best kids. And uh, she just really listened and kind of thought how to bring them forth. So she would always like talk with the kids and find out, get them involved in deciding what they needed to do to get back on track. Um, and the, the, uh, all the parents knew about this too. So, I mean, really bizarre things happen. So um, there was once like a five-year-old kid who uh, he was from a rich family you know, and they were like off in Europe and he was left with the staff. So, but they were told if anything happens, call Madeline Faust. So they called up on the phone and they said, Joel is up on the roof. You know, he thinks he's Superman. He's gonna like jump off. So she went you know, and talked to him and got him to come down. But it was that kind of thing. Everybody knew that, you know, go to Madeline Faust to, uh, you know, to connect with people and, you know, get them where they needed to be, even when they were in like really crazy, terrible places. So that kind of spirit of, of seeing, engaging, um, involving people, that's something she always did at all the different levels of what she did. Um, I'm not going to go in too much more detail, but, you know, it, uh, both in the eulogy and, and talking, I think, you know, anybody who knows, my mother knows that she was a make it happen person. You know, whatever, whatever level, you know, she was at, like emergency with this kid on the roof, uh, you know, being an innovator of uh, education styles, um, you know, she was a, a consultant with the Cleveland schools, you know, I, I mentioned, and, um, you know, working with inner city youth. Um, my son, by the way, thinking about making it happen people, you know, you're often a make it happen person, David, and uh, that certainly was a, a big thing, you know, from my, from my mother, and not just talking about it, but doing it. So just one example. Um, when I was at uh, Brandeis, you know, as an undergraduate, um, it was the beginning, the beginning of people talking about black power and, you know, really like changing things. And uh, I was like talking to my mother about this and she just kind of smiled and said, you know, why don't you come on a field trip with me? And I was home visiting. So um, she was, you know, working with uh, the, some of the inner city schools at the time. And uh, she said, you know, come, you know, come on this bus trip with us to Columbus. So uh, we were going to meet with Carl Stokes who then was a representative right before he would become mayor, you know. And so, I mean, she was working and empowering, you know, people of all backgrounds. That was the other thing, too, about her, that she really taught me to be able to reach out, whether um, from she was part of, whether meeting with presidents. I mean, she went to the White House uh, a couple times. She was on the Joint Accreditation Committee for universities, for edu schools of education, and for school systems reached out to international students. So she was called to meet with um, different, you know, high, high officials and things. But at the same time, you know, she could meet with anybody, you know, whether it's the custodian in the room or, you know, people in the inner city. You know, it was all the same to her. So um, that's another really important value. The, the final thing I wanted to um, kind of bring in is um, her strong sense of caring, reaching out to people and also standing up for what she believed. She was really strong in this. Um, sometimes she did go over the top, even hurt some people. Um, but overall, you know, in a real sense of things, she was very grounded and, uh, you know, really, um, you know, mostly really cared and reached out to people. And uh, this certainly, you know, affecting both for those, you know, around here that still remember her as well as, um, as well as remembering uh, all these people in Tampa, you know. So, um, you know, one of her friends here, Hoda Jabor, just uh, you know, um, want to reach out to um, that just last summer, my mother was helping her out with things, you know. She was already 96 and she was helping, you know, Hoda who's around my age. Um, and she would do these things with everybody. And in Florida, uh, in Tampa, where she's lived now, you know, the last many years, you know, she reached out and did so much with so many people that uh, that that they're now stepping up, you know, 
you know, they were helping in the last few days when she had trouble, you know, they were, you know, went way overboard, just really helping with everything, helping me now, you know, because of all that my mother did. So, you know, I feel so thankful for that. Um, and one, one kind of final thing, just sharing personally, I mean, I've shared some about how much she's influenced me. Um, I mean, really profoundly in this sense of, of seeing and, you know, making things happen. Uh, I mean, that's really been central to, you know, how I approach the world. My, um, my senior rabbinic thesis that really kind of motivates me was from Vayera, the portion where uh, Abraham, you know, God appears to Abraham, you know, um, and in, in the form of like Bedouins coming off the desert, you know, again, just, you know, anybody, you know, could be, you know, where God appears. But the key thing for me from that portion is that the word Vayera in Hebrew is the nifal sense, which is a passive reflexive sense. So that means that when God appears, it also means God was seen. So we need to open our eyes to see that potential of, 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 of God's presence, of holiness, of grace. And uh, you know, that was very much what I'm about, that I try to get other people to connect with. And also, you know, being a rabbi in, um, both in synagogues and on, on campus, you know, I do a lot of producing events in you know, and, and all kinds of ways, making things happen and doing it from a sensitive, open way to engage people and empower them. And one final, final thing that's very important that I want to uh, share with, with all of you is that, um, that one of the powerful things of the presence of my mother, and sometimes we had differences over the years, uh, and one of the things that made it work and that enabled me to always have love, even when I have differences with somebody in the family, including her, was um, was the sense of coming in in a loving, extended family. You know, for me, growing up, um, my grandparents, which we call mother and papa, actually, they were actually like second parents. And, you know, I spent much of my time with them. And when it came to... Um, any sense of, of differences, even early on, I was able to kind of differentiate. And, you know, my mother was strong-minded, but I could still you know, stand up for what I needed to do. So that was a gift and a blessing as well, you know, sensing kind of this legacy of our entire family. So I certainly pray to God that that sense of, of really, you know, stepping up and, and uh, feeling this, this love of blessings that comes in so many ways that whatever blessings um, that any of us and in, in this, I guess this is being videoed so some other people will see it too, that uh, whatever blessings that uh, my mother touched upon you, may that you know, strengthen us and may it also be a reminder you know, from sharing my remarks today that uh, to empower the blessings in ourselves and just you know, have, have from memory be a source of expanding blessings with God's help for both all the family now gone and all of us who continue and all of her friends and all of those that she has touched. Can you hear that sound? Zichrodah Libracha. Mole Rachamim, Shochen Bam Romim, Hametse Menuchanachona, Tahat Kan Fe Hashkina, Bemalot Kedoshim, Utehorim, Kazorakia Mazirim, Et Nishmat, Miriam Nicha, Bat Shmuel Yehud of Esther. Shalcha lo lama beganid ente hemenu chata ana bal harachemim hasti reha beseiter kenafecha liolamim utror bitror chamit nishmata adonai hu nachalata v'tanuach b'shalom amishkava v'nomar amen. 
May we remember all of the worthy and the righteous deeds that she performed in the land of the living. May her soul be bound up in the bonds of eternal life. God is now her portion. May she rest in peace. And we all say amen. We can be seated for another moment. Our condolences, of course, to Jeff and to Ellen, Erica and David, and to the entire family, of course. And uh, we'll move now to the uh, processional. We'll have the uh, burial spot arranged for us. We'll go there directly now. And then uh, following the burial, a visitation at the Sterling's house, uh, which I think you all know the address. <laughs> but I'll say it anyway, two, for the record, 26610 Hendon Road in Beechwood, and that will be immediately following the burial portion of the service. So we're going to ask the pallbearers to come forward. We're going to arrange the processional to the burial spot.